Good morning. So the Bible has a lot to say about our mouth and tongue and about the things we say and how we say them. In fact, in Proverbs, the book of wisdom, we have a lot written about this powerful gift we call language. The problem with a powerful gift is that it can be used wrongly and damage relationships. Turn with me into Proverbs 18 to read a warning about this. Proverbs 18, 1 to 8. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. When wickedness comes, so does contempt, and with shame comes reproach. The words of the mouth are deep waters, but the fountains of a wisdom is a rushing stream. It is not good to be partial to the wicked, and so deprive the innocent of justice. The lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. The mouths of fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very lives. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down in the inmost parts. There are many more proverbs about the misuse of of the tongue, but let's turn to a couple of proverbs about the wise use of words. So first, Proverbs 15, 1 to 2. Proverbs 15, 1 to 2. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. And next, Proverbs 17, 27 to 28. 17, 27 to 28. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. The New Testament confirms this message around our words. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, James, sorry, wrote a letter considered by many of the most practical of the New Testament letters. Turn to James 1 with me, where he writes about listening and doing. James 1, 19 to 26, and this is out of the New Living Translation. James 1, 19 to 26. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be all quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you for doing this. If you claim to be religious and don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. This last number of Sundays, we have begun a series of messages about our church being a healthy community of faith. Everybody would give mental assent to that. Now, what does it actually mean to say that we are a healthy community of faith, or this is what we want to be? Well, we've driven down the idea into a little bit more detail. And in our slide here, we have three components to it. That a healthy community of faith is one where everybody's welcome, where we admit that nobody's perfect, but that anything's possible. So we've done a number of messages about everybody being welcome. And now we come to this element about nobody's perfect. Because when we invite anybody, it means we're inviting people who are on a journey and may not be yet complete in Christ or even in their own development. And when you get together a bunch of people, it's a place then where we have differences And this is an important element for us to understand that no one's perfect, but we are all on a bit of a journey. And so it's in this second element here that no one's perfect that the rubber hits the road. But here's an interesting idea. No one's perfect, and that's why pencils have erasers. It's an important thing that you can edit when you're writing pencil. Now, when people get together, we have conversations And we use words in these conversations. And the scripture reading just a little bit earlier this morning, 
was telling us about the power of these words and the power to bring life or to bring death. And this is an element that we have to learn how to do, how to use this well. Because sometimes we say things that really need to be erased. And unfortunately, some people are not using pencils in their conversation. Instead, they're using permanent markers. And I'd like to help us today shift to writing our conversations in pencil. Because the scripture tells us there is great power in spoken words. This ability to speak a word and ideas pop into your mind is a stunning gift. And it's part of being made in the image of God. And this direct connection between this power of saying words and creating images in our mind is dramatically revealed in the fact that Jesus is called the Word, Logos. And that when he came and he spoke his words, they revealed the Father. There is power in life-giving words. But the scripture does warn us that incredible damage can happen when words are misused. We saw some of these scriptures a little earlier. The lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. That's a pretty dramatic phrase, isn't it? If your words are causing conflict and difficulty, then you really need to listen to today's message. Because our words will bring confusion and difficulty and strife, or they'll tend to bring life and understanding and purpose and life. The Bible tells us that there are better ways of using this gift. Like this one, the one who has knowledge, uses words with restraint. And whoever has understanding is even-tempered. Wow. Understanding the wise use of words, knowing the power of them and being careful with them, and knowing the danger of speaking when you're not even-tempered. The scripture is actually quite clear in the warnings about this. So what I would like to do today is delve into this matter of conversation and uh, take a magnifying glass and look at what happens. Here we have conversation happening between people. But what happens when things are said like this one here? Someone our little figure here in the green, says something that is quite dramatic and you have uh, other reactions and these people who are listening are saying, you said what? We know the impact of hearing conversations like that. We've all had them, haven't we? Maybe we've actually been the green person sometimes saying something that has impact, and you can tell there's impact because of the facial expressions on the people around. It's something, this conversation ability is something we use every day. It comes naturally. However, we need to train ourselves in the use of this one. Now, it seems simple, and it's natural, but when you study it closely, you find out that it's actually quite complex. So let me just put a freeze frame on this and say, let's, let's take a look at what's going on when something is said and there's a reaction happening. Let's just put a freeze frame and describe what's going on here. Here's what ha- is happening. Here's the person in our green figure here has a meaning or an idea that is coming from their heart. And they want to express it. It comes out of the heart and it comes through what we would call a filter. Now, this filter is our memories, our past conversations, our emotions, 
our assumptions that we have, our perspective of people around us, our values, it's a complex filter that actually colors everything that comes through it. And when we speak, our filters are active and happening. So we, the meaning that we intend here comes through the filter, it's affected by that filter, and we pick words and we say things. Then the person on the other end hears those words or words they thought they heard and they run those words through their own filter their own emotions their memories their perspectives and they attach a meaning to what they heard and you'll notice in this diagram here that there's several steps where the meaning intended in here in the green cloud actually gets distorted by the time it gets to the other person. It's changed potentially by the green filter. It's changed by the words you selected. It could be misinterpreted because the person didn't even hear the words right. It goes through their emotional filter and then they attach meaning to what you just said. Can you see how Things can go haywire in this. But this is happening instantaneously, in milliseconds. Someone says something and you feel the reaction in your own heart. You have gone through this process in parts of a second and you sense in your heart the meaning you thought this person intended. Now the true meaning that is intended to come out may not actually land up in the heart of the next person. And you can recommend it. You can probably remember uh, conversations like this. So let me tell you about one that we observed. This is not in Three Hills. Another place, other people, new names, few, few in fact changes. But this is a real event. Let's just talk about this one. Here's a gal that we're going to call Susie. And one day in our group there, she was complaining about her dogs and all the time it took and that they couldn't get away and because they had to take care of their dogs. And uh, they, they were just, she was just explaining some of the frustrations of her life. Well, another gal named Jane was listening there. And Jane loves dogs and was very good with them. And Jane offered to take care and says, I want to help, and offered to take the dogs. Well, this comment that she made went up through here, was heard by Susie, went through her filter, and I don't know what was going on in that filter. But the message she took from that comment was here. You think I'm incompetent. And she was offended that Jane had offered to take the dogs. Now, this is a problem. Because that was not Jane's intent at all. It was not her heart. It was not what she intended. But Susie took that. And it put a rift in this communication here. So, we felt we better try and help bring resolution to this. So we brought them together. We actually showed this kind of diagram to say, you know what was intended here by Jane's comment may not be what you were actually uh, thinking. So let's talk about this. And we sat down and invited Susie to listen to Jane again. We invited Susie to understand that Jane's intent was not to put her down, but to offer help. And to my complete bafflement, Susie was unwilling to adjust any understanding. She had written the conversation in permanent black ink. And the interpretation that she had made of Jane's comment was now indelibly 
put down and unwilling to change. Wow. That was a sad meeting. We left. And the relationship was permanently altered and broken between these two. So, what do we do when we have things like this? When we have conversations that hurt like this? Let's just go back to this picture here. When you hear say someone say something difficult and you think, you said what? Our most common response is to get tense and walk away. And you think, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he believes that. And we spend loads of time trying to figure out their motive and why they said that and what's going on in their life. Now, Scripture warns us that actually we can't tell what's going on in each person's heart. We don't see the heart of other people. Only the Spirit of God can see that. All we can see is the outward manifestations and we feel in our heart an interpretation but you really don't know the intent. We're guessing at best. So when it comes to difficult conversations like this, don't assume that you really know what was going on. Given the complexity of conversation and how it can get off in all these different stages, be humble about this. And understand that you may not have got it right. You may have heard it wrong. And you need to choose to withhold judgment. You're going to suspend judgment and I'm going to refuse to jump to conclusions. And what we have to do, the scripture tells us, that when you have ought with your brother, you go to them. And you re-engage in the conversation. And you ask some clarifying questions like, You know, I'm not sure I understood you right. Could you help me understand what you meant when you said this? Or what did you mean when you were saying this? Can you help me understand this better? And when they explain it again, you're giving them an opportunity to choose words again because they may have chosen the wrong words. Haven't you and I done that? We say something, we pick the wrong words, and it's the wrong message that comes out. One that comes to my mind was years ago, we were uh, visiting my aunt. And there had been, because of family family dynamics, uh, there was difficulty with this particular aunt. And didn't want to have anything to do with us. So she invited us to come and visit. And actually, we were having a good visit. And I was, we'd been there for a day, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we're kind of overstaying our time. Maybe I should, maybe it's time to just thank her and go on. And I picked the wrong words. My intent was to just say, you know, appreciate being here and um, we we can stay a little longer if you'd like, but the words that came out was, um, we appreciate you being here, but if you can stand us a little bit longer, we'll go, you know, we'll stay here. (laughs) Now, can you understand why she got the wrong message out of that one? I chose the wrong words. I had an intent. But in the process of working through this rather tense filter and not picking words carefully, the wrong message came out and she was offended. Now what I should have done was right then say, oh, just a minute, that came out wrong. And just stop the train and say, can I back that up again? I said it in a way that made, it, made you look bad. And I apologize for that. And I want to restate it again. And come up with a different set of words. In other words, the conversation should have been written in pencil. And I could take the eraser and say, Ah, just a second here. Let me erase those words. And I'm going to put different ones in here. And if I would have done that, it would have helped a ton. I didn't do it. I hadn't understood this process very well back then. But I can tell you that this gift of human conversation is powerful but it can go off the rails so easily so when something is said that brings a reaction or you feel a reaction 
Resist the temptation about jumping to conclusions. Hold it off. Bring this up in your mind again. Say, just a second, we're going to freeze frame this one and we're going to come back. And I'm going to come back to the person and ask them, what did you mean by that? Could you help me understand what you meant by this one here? In fact, one really good way to find out if you're getting it right is to say, so if I understand you right, you meant this, and you tell them what you thought you, they, you heard. And you allow the person to confirm back to you if you got it right or not. That is a very good way to get clarity about what did you actually mean. It also gives the person a chance to edit the words that they said. And when we are diligent about this process of really understanding each other, God will help us know how to have this healthy community of faith. So as I talk about this, I imagine that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind some conversation that might need re-engaging. Perhaps it was something you said that came out wrong. And you need to go back to those people that you kind of shocked and say, you know, I need to re-engage that conversation. I want to edit that conversation. And go back and explain better and further what that was. Or maybe, maybe there's a conversation where something was said by somebody that made you really wonder about that person. Made you wonder, what was the, what were they saying? What were they meaning about this? And what I want to urge you is, don't jump to conclusions about what was meant. Hold judgment. Go back, re-engage, and let them clarify. Let them help you understand. Because what I want to encourage you with is that conversations need to be written in pencil that allows you to edit. Don't make them with permanent black Sharpie ink. Now, a message like this How does this apply to Christian faith? Well, the scripture connects this conversation ability very directly with spirituality. In fact, it's that verse we read a little bit earlier. James chapter 1 and verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Wow, that is powerful words. It's a warning to all of us that we need to get skilled in handling this amazing gift that God's given us of words. So next week, I want to invite you to continue thinking about this. So we're going to talk about how to handle tough conversations. What do you do when there's a difficult conversation you need to have? How do you do that without blowing everything up? There are some very practical ways we can help you with that one. So, Father, I pray you'd help us with this powerful gift that you've given us. We understand that nobody's perfect. We're not going to get it right every time. And we're going to need to go back and edit. And I pray, oh God, that you would help us, that we'll have the grace to allow people to edit their conversation and that they will give us the grace to allow us to edit what we said so that we can understand what it means to be a healthy community of faith. Our closing scripture here, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Father, may that be true in our lives, increasingly so. Amen. God bless you as you go.